Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly in collaboration with Regina Magazine. I present to you a short conversation with Dr. Marianne Legato. Dr. Legato is professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University and also works at the Foundation for Gender Specific Medicine. Today she's going to talk about whether or not there really are substantive differences between men and women and how those differences affect the way we relate to one another and to the world. So Dr. Legato, it's great to have you here on the show. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. There seems to be a notion that has gained some measure of prevalence in some circles that there are essentially no real differences between men and women, and that aside from a few anatomical differences, we're all basically the same underneath, that we think the same, feel the same, we approach the world in the same way, but your research has revealed otherwise, and I heard you offer an anecdote once about a little girl who was given four trucks for Christmas instead of dolls. <laughs> yes. And I, I really love that story. I thought it could Isn't serve that as a, a great good story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd actually like you to tell the listeners about it because I thought it would good, give okay, a good well, backdrop to the whole nature versus nature I am thing. sure everyone listening to this program will agree with me. Boys and girls, men and women are different. We all know they are. And the science of the last two decades absolutely supports not only that we're different, but we're different in every system of the body. And even the very genes, which are the same, are expressed differently whether as a function of whether we're male or female, so that the very composition of all of our tissues is different, depending on whether we're men or women. Nowhere is it more interesting than in the brain. Men's brains are bigger. They have more white matter than we do. We have more gray matter. The whole chemistry of the brain, the electrical activity, and the parts of the brain that we use to perform the same tasks differ depending on whether we're men and women which prompted me to write a book which was, I have to tell you, the most fun of any book I ever wrote, <laughs> called Why Men Never Remember and Women Never Forget, which explains the impact that the differences in the way our brains work impacts our behavior and why communication is not always easy between the two sexes. So what was this story about this little girl who received four trucks? What well, this comes them? from a colleague of mine, Dr. George Lazarus, whose mother came in with her daughter, and she said, we believed that raising our little girl just in the same way we would a little boy would result in no differences in behavior between our son and our daughter. So we gave our little girl four big trucks for Christmas. And she opened the package and seemed to be delighted. And we noticed a couple of hours later that she was nowhere to be found. So we went upstairs with her and her bedroom door, and she came to the door, put her finger to her lips and said, shh, they're sleeping. And what she had done was taken her four trucks as though they were dolls, put them in bed, covered them up, and was giving them their afternoon nap. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that for George Lazarus and for me was a quintessentially uh, yes. useful story about the differences between boys and girls who oh, are totally different. That's so funny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I understand. Also, Larry Summers, who's president emeritus of Harvard, he, he gave his daughter a truck. And what did she do with it? She gave the truck a name. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> right. I mean, boys don't give their trucks names. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a precious story. Well, I think the idea that we're, we're not different and that it's only a question of nurturing and uh, instruction and the way boys and girls are treated that makes them different is totally without any scientific basis. So I think, you know, the differences are real, they're significant, and they're much more abundant and powerful than we had ever understood before we began to study the differences between boys and girls. Right. Now, your book, titled Why Men Never Remember and Women Never Forget, very interesting. And I guess for our listeners, in a nutshell, why is it that men never remember and women never forget? Well, men process one thing at a time. They have a direct linear approach. They see the problem, they assess it, they give it a solution, and it's over for them. They have no uh, intense response even to uh, an argument or an unpleasant experience which is recorded in their memory the way women do and which causes them to obsess over it. When a woman has an unpleasant experience, 
she is prompted to secrete the stress hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is also secreted in men, but that level of stress hormone goes down immediately in men, but persists for 24 hours in women. And while it's useful to make a response acutely, in terms of continuing to be secreted, it really impairs people's ability to think clearly and makes them obsess over the details of the unpleasant experience. So when a man and a woman have a quarrel, for the man it's over as soon as the conversation is finished. He puts it away, so to speak. It doesn't occur to him to mull over it and think about it again. She will, on the other hand, continue to think about the details of the argument, her responses, possible solutions, etc., for about 24 hours. So when they arrive at the breakfast table, she says, about that conversation we were having last night and wants to continue the discussion, and his response is, what's all the fuss about? We settled that. What are you talking about? And he's on to the next thing. And I think that's one of the reasons that there is difficulty. It, it isn't that it doesn't matter to him. It's simply that he processes the information, he responds to it with an appropriate amount of attention, and then forgets about it, as opposed to his female consort. That's very interesting. You know, you've also spoken a bit about the effects of testosterone in men and how uh, testosterone kind of mutes the experience of pain. Could you talk a little bit about that? How yes, it affects men? Yes, testosterone is a very interesting hormone, and men were the ones who did the hunting and the pursuit of game to feed their colony or their family. And high testosterone makes men intensely bellicose uh, or warlike. It increases their sexuality and their sexual drive, and it also mutes pain so that in trekking big game, for example, if the man or the male remembered the last time he was clawed or mauled or gored, it would really impede his success as a hunter for the next uh, endeavor. So men are selected out to be aggressive, to take risks, and to minimize uh, physical pain or the experience of pain. And so that is one of the uh, striking differences between men and women. Now, men and women have different responses to different kinds of pain, and women are more susceptible to pain from electrical stimuli than men. We don't know why that is, but the other problem with researching men's response to pain in the laboratory is that it's absolutely true that if, if the scientist is a woman and is asking for a response about pain, in response to a stimulus that uh, she delivers, men will minimize the amount of pain that they say they feel. If the investigator is a male, the answer will be more forthcoming. So it's hard to research pain in the present, if you will, but we do think that there's a difference in response to pain of different kinds in terms of men and women. Very interesting. You've also spoken about how uh, some girls have a disorder in which their adrenal glands secrete too much testosterone. How, how do they exhibit behavior? Well, these little girls have what's called congenital hyperadrenalism. Their adrenal glands, which control the production of stress hormones, hormones that are masculinizing, make the levels of those hormones too high, even in the uterus. And these girls are masculinized. They have the abilities of males more than most girls, which is that they can navigate three-dimensional space with great success. They know how to find where they're going with great efficiency. Their play habits are much more like that of boys. They're less verbal, and they're much more physically active, and even their body habitus, depending on how high their stress hormone, their adrenal hormones are, is different. So the effect of what we call congenital hyperplasia of the adrenal glands on these girls is pretty dramatic. Wow. Okay, so you've just discussed that men and women handle stress differently. You've also talked about um, depression being yep. the, the male silent killer. Can you talk about that too? Yes, I think men are, this is, uh, you know, we can't escape the effect of environment and training and culture on uh, the finished product, so to speak. And little boys from the time they're small are asked to suck it up, be brave, take the offensive, not suffer injury passively, and are discouraged from discussing or complaining about pain or their feelings. And this is very characteristic of men who usually come to my office, at least when they're acutely sick, because their wives force them to do it. 
<laughs> literally. Right. Uh, and when they do come in and you get to spend an hour or two with them, it's not always easy for them to say, well, yes, I am very sad. I've lost my job. I'm anxious about my future or my marriage isn't going well or something my children have done or will do is disappointing to me. And I think, therefore, that we, because of the lack of ability of men to feel legitimate about talking about uh, feeling sad or feeling inadequate, we minimize the frequency of depression in men. And men will often become hypersexual and start pursuing sex more vigorously. They will drink. They will become extremely contentious and cranky and argue at the drop of a hat. Whereas women will tell you in a more direct way, I feel sad, I'm crying all the time, and will speak much more freely about what the issues basically are rather than what we call acting out, which is more characteristic of men. So I think our tendency to underestimate the frequency of depression in men is, is uh, a result of, in part, the way we train them. On our website, we have a very interesting interview with Ann Curry, who is a chief correspondent of NBC, as you know, and she's a remarkable person. And she talks about raising boys and the effect that the way we raise them teaches them not to complain and to suffer in unfortunately, counterproductive silence about how they feel and what they are enduring. Right. And I think, too, um, because men have this tendency not to communicate their emotions as easily as, as women do, I think, unfortunately, a lot of women get this impression that men simply don't feel things as intensely. That's right. But that's not that's true, right. right? Absolutely not true. They don't obsess over injury. They, they, uh, you know, when a woman has an unpleasant experience, her hormones, estrogen and progesterone, make a very detailed memory of that experience. It's it's a unique to women, and it's always amusing when you watch Law and & Order and the police interview a couple to see that often the man's uh, interpretation of what happened has more impact. But in fact, women can form a more detailed uh, memory of, of many things, including an unpleasant experience. If you read a book or a page or a story to women and men, a woman will be much more accurate and much more detailed about her memory of what was read to her than the man. So I think all of these things make how we interact difficult yeah. at times. Yeah. You know, you've also spoken on uh, and written on falling in love and what is it that attracts men, women to each other and causes them to fall in love. Could you talk about this a little bit? To me, the most interesting thing that I've found in my reading and, and work with uh, gender differences is that women create the pace in courtship. Does that surprise you? No, <laughs> not too much. <laughs> <laughs> and there have been studies of watching men and women in public places uh, who initiate a flirtation, and it's the woman who not only initiates it with usually expression or glances or staring, but can change the pace by the intensity with which she does provocative things. She will arch her back, she will flip her hair, she will smile, laugh readily at any comment that the man makes, and she will also signal whether or not she's available. And interestingly enough, men will pursue a flirtation or an interchange with a woman if he feels that she is in fact ultimately going to be available to him. If she totally, really is unresponsive, he will sense that, and in general, we're speaking of the average person now, not uh, pathologically aggressive people, uh, he will back off. In general, men relate to a, a healthy uh, smile. While they're attracted to heav heavy bosoms in terms of short sexual exchanges, in fact, that's not a factor in their choice of a mate usually. They do, however, seem to gravitate to wide hips which probably guarantees easier childbirth. So those are all sort of primitive things, but they do operate. There's also the interesting subject of pheromones. Have you heard about that? A little bit, yeah. I was just going to ask you about that. Well, animals, obviously, if you, I, off, I walk to work every day, and one of the fascinating things for me is that dogs, for example, who abound in New York City, will sniff at each other, particularly in the genital region, region immediately. And it can be the tiniest dog and the biggest mastiff, and clearly they relate through smell. 
Um, it's very evident that smell is an extremely important attractant between animal mates. And I think that there are probably pheromones that we don't understand or appreciate consciously between men and women that may well operate in initial attraction. There are men, for example, I've heard, who request a specific perfume that they like uh, when they meet a new woman. And uh, so I think smell plays a very important part. Very interesting. So, uh, you know, we all want better marriages, and a key to better yes. marriages is understanding each other. So what would you say are some key things that women need to know about men in order to better understand them, appreciate them, get along with them, and thus experience happier marriages? Well, that's a wonderful question, and I appreciate your asking it. I've had women come up after I've lectured and tell me that had they understood what I had been saying or had known what I had been talking about, they never would have divorced their husband. And that was not wow. just a what time. That's a very frequent response. I think you have to understand that we're not alike. We have different roles from an evolutionary point of view. The communication and bonding, verbal communication in particular, as women, we're better at it. We choose it. We reach out for friends when we're in trouble. And we form a social network that is firmly supportive and very useful to us in times of trouble. And many women, I'm sure you've heard this too, Christine, will say, I can talk better to my friend than I can to my husband. It's so irritating. Men, on the other hand, are rather uh, loners. Uh, they often depend on their wives for any social structure once they're married. They, uh, they delegate to their wives any formation of entertainment schedules, friendships, visits between friends. And I think that they're much less likely to uh, be able to form close bonds with another person. This is just a generalization, of course. So I think what we have to understand is that there are differences in the abilities and, of men and women uh, in the way they deal with life, and I think that the thing to communicate, the rules that, if you will, or the guidelines that I like to give women for communicating with a man is, number one, get his attention when he's not busy doing something else. Men are not parallel processors. And I don't mean just the Belmont race to see if their horse is going to come in. But I mean anything at all, if they're, you know, making something in the shop or cooking up a, a special dish or whatever they're doing, wait until there's a moment in which you can really get the person's attention. Then say what you mean. Do not depend on facial expression. Don't give your husband a sad look and expect him to say, what's wrong? It's uh, notorious that men do not recognize sad expressions in women. They, are, they recognize best fear or anger, but they are not very good at decoding a sad facial expression. Tears, interestingly enough, from a woman depress the level of testosterone in men's bloodstream, which I find fascinating. Probably <laughs> not particularly relevant, but a sad expression won't do it. So you have to use words, be simple, be brief, and say what it is you want without being attacking. In other words, you have to frame the sentence so that you ask for the man's help rather than saying you're a cad and right. you hurt me. It's much better to say, I have an issue and I wish you could help me with it, which is to say that when I want to write a check for a certain amount of money for my joint account, I, I find that I I don't have the right information about how much is actually in there. Is it possible that you could help me deal with that? Maybe you could record every time that you write a check in our master checkbook, or you could remember to tell me, or have your secretary tell me, right. so that I'm not operating without all the data. And even though that can be very annoying to you, <laughs> if you put it in a non-aggressive way, you're much more likely to get a collaborative response, I think. Right. So I think getting the horse's attention, not interrupting a man when he's doing anything that, that requires his concentration, saying what you want briefly and simply in a non-aggressive way and asking for his help in solving the issue is very effective. Right. And one thing, too, I want to get your feedback on this. I've read that as women, we like to help by offering advice, even when it's unsolicited, whereas a lot of times men take that almost as a, a sign of disrespect or criticism, as if, you know, we're telling them what to do. Yeah, uh, well, what I've had men and women in my lectures fighting with each other in the audience to, to a point where 
it's just appalling to, to everybody else. <laughs> and I think to engage in a contentious series of mutual ac- accusations is not helpful. And one very interesting thing that I have found uh, helpful in people who are quarreling and nobody is getting anywhere is for one of the people to say, I don't want to have this conversation right now. I will discuss it with you, but not right now. And then to walk away from the conversation if it's getting out of hand or becomes inappropriately abusive on either side. So I think that's a good thing to remember. I don't want to have this conversation. Right. All right. Well, fascinating discussion. So where can listeners learn more about you and your work online? Well, we have a website, gender.medicine.com, and we have founded and conduct the Foundation for Gender-Specific Medicine, which is dedicated to an understanding of the differences between the normal function of men and women and the way in which they experience illness. So look for us on the web. We have lots of interesting things. We try to keep you current about what's the latest thing in gender-specific medicine. And we are trying to teach the world, not just the public, but our colleagues in medicine, that gender-specific medical practice really is more effective than treating the human population as though everyone is exactly the same, which, which they aren't. Right. And could you repeat the uh, website address again? Sure. Gender.medicine.org. Wonderful. Okay. Well, Dr. Legato, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today, and thank you for this fascinating discussion. Thank you. All right, signing off, I'm Christine Niles of Forward Boldly. Remember that you can find all our archived shows at forwardboldly.com. You can also hear our podcasts at blog.reginamag.com. Thanks for listening. And in the words of St. Joan of Arc, in God's name, Forward Boldly. Thank you.